Welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, coming to you from SciStarter's virtual world headquarters. In this episode, we're talking pollination, that crazy annual bacchanal involving bribes of nectar and interspecies canoodling. National Pollinator Month is over, you say? Maybe, but pollinating season is still in full force, and these Citizen Science projects need your help tracking it. Each spring, nature bursts forth in a frenzy of activity, with birds, bugs, and beasts moving or migrating to find new homes, establishing their territory, building nests, and finding mates. But plants are stuck. They can't migrate. They can't go off looking for mates. So in order not to be forever stuck in one place, using up local resources and mating with their cousins for all eternity, they need help. Later in the year, they'll tuck their seeds into tasty fruits and berries or coat them with sticky Velcro so that mobile creatures can carry them to new territory. But first, how are they going to make seeds? Hopefully with that cute shrub in the next meadow. Pollination, that's how. For the past 134 million years, give or take, flowering plants have been luring bugs, birds, and bats to their enticing petals to pick up some pollen and carry it to flowers way over there gradually increasing their range and genetic diversity. And today, many plants and pollinators can't live without each other. But now, as you probably know, many of those pollinators are endangered. And that's trouble not only for them, but also for the plants that rely on them and on the many other organisms that rely on the plants, including us. Saving Earth's pollinators is a big job, and that's why we need lots of citizen scientists just exactly like you to help. And let's start with bumblebees. Everyone talks about honeybees, Apis mellifera, hugely productive honey-producing machines imported from Europe. But arguably, bumblebees are more important ecologically, at least in North America, because they co-evolved with so many native plants. Rich Hatfield is a conservation biologist for the Xerces Society and heads up Bumblebee Watch, a citizen science project dedicated to preserving bumblebees. Hi, Rich. Thanks for uh, taking the time to speak with us. Sure thing. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So um, I'm a kind of a bee fanatic, and so I'm especially excited to hear about Bumblebee Watch. Can you tell us a bit about it and why it's so cool and, and so important? Yeah, um, it is pretty cool. It's I, I think one of the coolest things about it is just how many people all over the country have gotten really interested in in bees and pollinators like yourself, and specifically um, bumblebees, and really have helped to contribute so much knowledge using this web app. So it's really been beneficial from us. But it really, it was born out of a relationship that we had with Sheila Kola. And by we, I mean the Xerce Society. Um, Sheila is a researcher based up in Canada. And we were just interested back in the early days, sort of in the late 2000s and early 2010s, we were just tracking a few species of really rare bumblebees using email, basically. We were asking people to send us you know, emails of observations. And we were, you know, we were getting emails from all over the continent, people that were interested in helping with this effort. And we didn't really have the capacity to like enter the data from all these emails that were coming in because most of the observations that folks were sharing with us were not these rare species. They were actually, you know, some other more, much more common species that maybe looked alike, but, but you know, bumblebee identification is not simple. It's not an easy thing. So we sort of put our brains together and decided that we were going to try to launch a community science platform where folks could upload their photos and essentially enter all the data themselves um, so that we didn't have to do that piece of it. All we were going to have to do is the identification piece of it. How many kinds of bumblebees are there and, and how do you tell them apart? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, here in North America, we have around 50 species of bumblebees. Um, and in the world, there's probably somewhere between 250, 300 species of bumblebees. So it's a fairly diverse group, although not overly diverse. So I think one of the nice things about bumblebees is, you know, 50 species is fairly manageable. Like if you wanted to really learn a group or, or uh, of animals to learn how to identify, it's actually a fairly manageable group. To, to sort of handle, especially if you just think about sort of your backyard or, you know, your state or your county. Those are all, you know, reason, probably reasonable um, to, to be able to learn to tell them apart. And it's not too different than, than say, birding or, or even, um, you know, looking at butterflies or, or even flowers, right? There's just these micro features that we're looking for on, on 
on the species and you know using those things to tell the difference between other ones so for, for bumblebees mostly we're using color patterns um, so they have you know three body parts their head their thorax and um, their abdomen and all of those three body parts have different banding patterns you know some species will have a black face and a yellow head um, some species will have a yellow face and a yellow head um, they'll have a spot on their thorax or a band between the wings um, or their thorax will be mostly black and then you know their abdomen usually has some pattern of yellow white um, red and black and different parts of the body have different colored stripes on them. And those are generally the features that we're using to tell the difference between species. Um, although there are some morphological characteristics as well. One thing that you'll often hear experts refer to is, is the malar space or the malar space or the cheek length, which is actually sort of the distance between the bottom of the eye and its mandibles. It's longer in some species corresponding to the length of the bee's tongue. Wow. But mostly we leave that to you guys because that sounds like yeah. a really tricky one. Wow. <laughs> and and um, so do they, are they specialists? Do, do bumblebees, you know, specialize on particular flowers or are they more like generalists? Well, I mean, what we know suggests that bumblebees are more or less generalists. They have been found, you know, most species have been found for foraging on a wide you know, diversity of, of flowering plants, many different plant families in, in most situations. But, I, you know, they because there are so many different species and because they do have these different length tongues and any sort of habitat that we create for bumblebees, we really want to make sure that there are a diversity of shapes, sizes, and colors to support all of the species of bumblebees. Because I think one of the things that we as conservation biologists that are working on bumblebees think about, and not just bumblebees, all species of bees, is, is by putting flowers on the ground, even though they're generalists, we don't want to just make common bees more common. We also want to support the rare species. And so we want to make sure to put a diversity of flowering plants on the ground to support all of the species you might find in an area. And they tend to be bigger than, I mean, in general, I guess, bigger than other bees. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about, um, I think it's sonication, where they just kind of get on a flower and just shake the bejeebers out of it to get <laughs> the pollen out. And, and, and I guess not every bee can do that, right? Yeah, that's true. Not, not every flower sort of benefits from that and not every bee can do it. Um, but there are about, I think it's something like 15% of the, of the plants out there in the wild um, have their pollen more or less fused inside the anthers. And the only way to get it out is to shake it. Um, and often like at a particular audio frequency. And, and bumblebees are very good at this. They, they actually latch their mouth parts, their mandibles onto the flower and then vibrate their wings. Um, and you can hear this uh, on the flower. You know, when a bumblebee is generally flying through the air, they have kind of this low sort of bomber airplane sound of brrrr. <laughs> and then you hear them land on one of these flowers and they have this high pitched frequency buzz that they do. It's like, bzz, 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 bzz. and sometimes they do it in short little bursts. And if you've seen videos of this, it almost looks like the pollen is coming out of the anthers at that point, like a salt shaker, you know, like it just comes pouring out onto the bee's body and, and then they groom it, you know, into their, into their pollen carrying um, baskets on their legs. Cool. So how yeah. do people get involved in this? Uh, uh, and I assume you need more volunteers. And, and, and what do people do? Yeah, we're, of course, we're always looking for folks to go out and, and look for bumblebees and let us know what they're seeing in any part um, of, of North America. And really, all folks need is, is a phone um, or, or a camera and, and access to the Internet and, um, you know, snap a couple photos. It's always best to try to get as many different angles uh, of the bee as you possibly can. And, and this is not a <laughs> not an easy thing to do as they're often moving quickly through space. Um, and so one of the recommendations that I often tell people is to actually take a video um, of the bee. And you can't actually upload the video, but if you sort of think that you can move the, the video through time and pause it at different times when you get different angles and then take a screenshot or, or extract a still photo out of that, if you have that sort of technical ability, um, that's a really great way to get, you know, in focus photos or shots of different angles of bees. Um, and then you just go to bumblebeewatch.org. 
Um, set up an account if you don't already have one and then follow the pretty simple steps to enter your location and um, and the plant that you saw it foraging on and, and upload those photos. You can upload up to five photos for each individual bee um, and then hit submit. And then it, it gets put into our queue um, and then experts, um, you know, the, the taxonomists that work at Circes and Wildlife Preservation Canada and York University, you know, are making their way through those photos. Do you want people to focus on kind of strange looking bee, you know, bees they're not seeing a lot of or just take any bumblebee that, that they happen to come across? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're just sort of in your backyard or, or hiking somewhere else and you see something that, that doesn't look like a bee you've seen a hundred times before, that yeah, that, that probably is the best focus realistically. But you could be a novice that doesn't, um, that can't tell the difference, can't tell what's unique. And so really every observation is a good one um, to, to share. And it's great to have those, even if we don't get back you know, within a couple of months, eventually we're going to work our way through those data and they'll make their way into the database and contribute to conservation. Great. All right. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. appreciate the conversation. Thanks for letting people know about Bumblebee Watch. While some pollinators live generation after generation in the same area, others migrate, moving to upper latitudes throughout the spring and summer and take advantage of the later blooming periods of their favorite flowers. The popular citizen science project Journey North tracks many migratory animals, and pollinators like monarch butterflies and hummingbirds are among the most popular. We have Journey North program coordinator Nancy Sheehan with us to tell us more. All right. Hi, Nancy. Thanks for being with us. Hi. So glad to join you. So Journey North, boy, it is sort of the um, one of the earliest and most popular, I think, of the citizen science projects. But I think some people, for some reason, still may not know about it. So maybe you could just tell us what Journey North is all about. Yes, absolutely. So yes, Journey North did begin in 1993 at the wow. dawn of the internet. So if anybody out there can actually imagine a <laughs> time <laughs> when the internet wasn't as well known, uh, that's when Journey North started. So Journey North is a citizen science program. It's crowdsourced contributory citizen science program. And we have volunteers from across North America. So Canada, the U.S., Mexico, Latin America, Caribbean uh -huh. countries. So we really have a broad um, breadth of coverage and mm -hmm. our volunteers uh, help us to track migratory species. So maybe we'll focus on some of the pollinator ones that you um, yes. that you track. So so what are some of those and, and what are you learning? Hummingbirds and mm -hmm. monarchs are two pollinator species that we track. We're asking volunteers to let us know the, where they see monarchs uh, and hummingbirds, mm -hmm. uh, what behaviors they're exhibiting. For example, if they see in our neck of the woods here or the home base of uh, Journey North, which is at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Arboretum, of course, we have more ruby-throated hummingbirds. So what are those ruby-throated hummingbirds doing in your garden? Are they nectaring? What, are they, what flowers are they nectaring from? Are they at your bird feeder, mm -hmm. the hummingbird bird feeder? So really trying to get people to think about not only that species, but uh, also what they need to survive. So pollinator gardens. So we're uh, talking a lot in our news updates about, oh, what kind of flowers are out there? What are important flowers to uh, plant in mm -hmm. your gardens to uh -huh. help provide habitat for these pollinator migratory species? So mm -hmm. And it's really something for all ages. I know some of the projects you really uh, you know, need to be an adult or need to have certain equipment or gear in order to participate in this. But this seems like it's more, you know, basically all ages. Yeah. So I think that's another hallmark of Journey North. We try to make the um, entry into the citizen science, into our citizen science world uh, fairly easy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of course, anyone under 13, it's recommended that they work with their parent or guardian or an adult, uh, but it's very easy to register with Journey North. And it is, we have a very simple process for submitting observational reports. Okay. So how do we get started? 
Uh, mm-hmm. So you go to journeynorth.org. It's fairly okay. easy uh, to remember. And there's a tab at the very top of our menu that says register. You do have to set up a, uh, an account. So you enter your name and your address. You set a password. And then once you register, then you hop on over to the sightings tab and wow. you can go ahead and submit an observation, right which away. allows you to put not only the date and, and the species observed, but upload a photograph, which uh, is optional, but very much encouraged. Oh, okay. Yeah. So can I say one more thing also? Oh, yeah, of course. That even, of course. even if people do not register and uh, decide to submit observations, uh-huh. uh, we hope that People read it, the news updates, and also you can uh, watch the migration unfold uh, on our real-time maps. So we have maps yeah. for all the data submitted by our volunteers, so you can actually watch like the monarch butterflies uh, arrival in the spring from either their, their sanctuary in Mexico mm-hmm. or in California or the, the ruby throat or other uh, hummingbird species as they progress north in the spring and uh-huh. south in the fall. Nice. All right. Well, let's see. Um, Anything else, anything new, anything we need to make sure that our listeners know about? Well, I think the big uh, action message that I always um, have for volunteers is just to get outside, rejoice in uh, what is happening in your own backyard. It doesn't have to be a big backyard. It could be your patio or it could be a natural area. Mm -hmm. And just start to make observations because there's so many wonderful things to discover and come with curiosity and enthusiasm. And and then, of course, you can submit your observations to Journey North. But first, it's the discovery and then the joy of just being outside. Great. That's great advice. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Monarch butterflies were the first organism tracked in Journey North, and today they remain one of the most popular and charismatic migratory creatures. Most of them gather to spend the winter in a single small grove of trees in Mexico. In spring, they begin moving north, and after three or four butterfly generations, reach the northern U.S. and Canada. The Monarch Larva Monitoring Project provides critical site-specific information on the butterfly's annual trek, with information collected by anyone who has access to a patch of milkweed, the monarch caterpillar's preferred food source. Karen Oberhauser is founder and director of the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Hi, Karen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here. Yeah, this project has been around for such a long time. Could you tell us a bit about how it got started? Sure. This actually started in 1996. So yes, we have been around for a long time. And it started in my lab at the University of Minnesota, where one of my students was studying survival of monarch eggs and caterpillars. Mm -hmm. And we were monitoring sites around our campus and we started monitoring on a regular basis, a site in in Western Wisconsin, where we'd go every single week, everybody in the lab would drop everything they were doing and um, it was great fun. And at the end of that first summer, we thought we could engage other people in this project. And this was really before citizen science was kind of a thing. Uh So we um, recruited people from throughout the country. And in those days, the internet was not quite as accessible as it is now. So we sent out hard copies of our data sheets to people all over the country. And it grew from that. Okay. So assuming you still need volunteers, um, how would I get involved or how do our listeners get involved? Yeah, we would love more people to be involved. Uh-huh. And basically, all you need is a site. You you need to have a site where you can find some milkweed plants. We recommend that people have at least 10 milkweed plants. Some of our volunteers look at hundreds. Um, some look at 10 or 15 or 20. And then you just Um, read the directions on how to do it. We're always available for help. We have a lot of online modules that tell people how to do different parts of the project. So we try to make it as easy as possible for people to find direction. Huh. And how much of a commitment is it? Is it something where people um, post every day or every week or how does that work? Well, you know, people are volunteers and we understand that. We 
kind of the ideal volunteer goes out once a week. Um, we ask that they not go out more often than that, just because they might see the same egg twice. Mm-hmm. And it's difficult for us to, to kind of factor in, is that the same egg or not? Uh huh. Now I found, and, and I suspect it's because of climate change, but maybe not. Um, so I have milkweed and I found that it was all grown and kind of dying or scraggly by the time the monarchs got there. So I like cut back maybe three quarters of them right to the ground. At, I don't know. I don't I, I, just whenever I feel like it, I guess. But usually there's strong young plants that are coming up by the time there are any butterflies. So is that something that people have to do or, or that you see in other sites? It will depend on the year. So in a year where milkweed starts early, if you have a very warm, dry spring, that can happen, that the milkweed is kind of dying back by the time that the monarchs come. I mean, it's interesting that the timing of cutting the milkweed and its ability to re-sprout is, um, varies from year to year. So in a really dry year, it's not going to grow back. So you kind of want to be a little careful of that. But um, ha- what, what I actually recommend is that if people want to ensure that they have good condition milkweed for monarchs across the season is that they plant a diversity of milkweed because mm. there are species that have what we call indeterminate growth that the plants just keep producing new green leaves throughout the season. Um, that's oh, true yes. with a something called whorled milkweed, which is Asclepias verticillata, which has really fine, small leaves. But those leaves, because it keeps growing all year, there are leaves in good condition at the end of the summer. And in a really wet year, swamp milkweed will do really well. So Asclepias incarnata will be in good condition Mm -hmm. at the end of the year. So having a diversity of milkweed makes it more likely that the monarchs will find some milkweed across the whole year. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Great. All right. Let's see. Anything else that we should make sure people know? Yeah. I think a really important thing for people to know about monitoring monarchs is monarchs have captured the attention of people throughout North America, Mexico, Mm -hmm. Canada, the United States. And We know what we know about monarchs because there are so many people monitoring them. Uh, We have people monitoring every phase of the annual cycle, the spring migration with Journey North, the breeding season with the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, the fall migration with Journey North and Monarch Watch. We have people monitoring diseases of monarchs. So All of these people collectively together Mm -hmm. have led to this understanding of monarchs that probably is not paralleled by our understanding of any other non-pest insect. We've we've done a lot of research on pests, but I think I'm I'm probably not exaggerating when I say that we know more about monarchs than any non-pest insect, and that's because people care and people have joined this monitoring. And kind of on the flip side of that is we know a lot about monarchs because of people's engagement, but also we need that engagement across monarchs cover such a large area. Mm -hmm. And there's just no way that scientists acting individually or even collectively could monitor monarchs. We need that broad spatial coverage. We need that broad temporal coverage throughout the whole year. So we really couldn't have done this without all of the volunteers. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'd encourage people to get involved. There's just a lot of ways. Monarchs are probably um, found within a few miles of anywhere in the 48 states that make up the biggest part of the United States. So no matter where you are, you can make a difference in monitoring monarchs. That is great. And we couldn't do it without you and without your getting people excited and collecting all this data and putting it together. So thank you. Yeah. I mean, doing something like this for a long time is is really fun. And it's been 
amazing to meet all the people that I have through the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. I mean, I have I kind of feel like I could go almost anywhere in the country and find a volunteer there, and um, they'd, they'd feel like a, a good friend. Well, thanks so much for joining us, and good luck with the project. Thank you. Well, that's it for this edition of the Size Starter Podcast, but that is just a taste of the many pollinator-related projects you'll find at SizeStarter.org. You can find a few of the most popular at SizeStarter.org slash Pollinator Gardens, and use the Project Finder to search for lots more. We hope you'll check it out. I'm Bob Hershon. Thanks for listening. This podcast is brought to you each month by SciStarter, where you will find thousands of citizen science projects, events, and tools. It's all at SciStarter.org. That's S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R dot O-R-G. SciStarter's founder is Darlene Cavalier. And thanks so much to you, the listener and the citizen scientist, for getting involved and making a difference. If you have any ideas that you want to share with us and any things you want to hear on this podcast, get in touch with us at info at SciStarter.org. Once again, our email address is info at SciStarter.org. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.